Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, April 24th, and this is the weekly market update. So anything that you see or hear in this video or here on the podcast is not to be taken as investment advice. I am not an investment advisor. This is my personal opinions and basically my views on things. Do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay. It's going to be a fun one this week. In the reality check, uh, in the previous week, I think it was two days ago, I think it was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And this is, you know, the environmentalists celebrating the Earth. And I don't know the whole thing. I don't pay any attention to it, except for the fact that I was reading an article about um, basically uh, that had a link to a another article at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, which basically has catal is cataloging or has cataloged a fun little montage of all the failed predictions that all of these so-called experts and scientists have made going back 50 years. I mean, people like Hansen, who's this big um, environmental guy, you know, the Earth's going to end guy, his failed predictions, Paul Ulrich, Earl Elric, Elric, however you pronounce his name, who was the guy that wrote the population bomb that, you know, he's been wrong forever. I mean, these people have never been right. And I just picked out one uh, little picture. I'll put a link to it because it's kind of fun to go through. Um, it's actually sad. It's a testament to propaganda and, you know, the the ability for the media, the government, thought leaders, whatever you want to say, to shape public opinion. Uh, basically, we don't really have too big of problems and when it comes to these things, but they've made it into this doomsday type situation. And we'll get into why that is. But I just, you know, this is the guy I like to pick on. I haven't picked on him in a while. Al Gore, the former vice president under <laughs> Bill Clinton. And it now sent a millionaire. Um, he was the guy that was advocating, you know, inconvenient truth, the movie, Earth's going to burn up. It's going to, you know, we're going to flood everything, rising sea levels. This particular prediction uh, that was uh, cataloged by Anthony Watts at, at What's Up With That. It's a climate skeptic blog. Um, Ten years ago, Al Gore predicted the North Pole ice cap would be gone inconveniently, I guess, at least for Al Gore, it's still there. And this was uh, the byline, the dateline, uh, December 16th, 2018. So, you know, you don't hear much from Al Gore anymore because he's made his money and he's moved on, right? Um, he's a centimillionaire. He is a grifter. He promulgated this fraud, twisted the facts and made his money. And what does he care, right? I mean, you don't even hear from him anymore. Uh, does anybody listen to this guy? Does anybody know where he's at? Uh, he's counting his money and laughing all the way to the bank. And so I will put the um, link to that, you know, series of that article. You know, what I inevitably will get will be an ankle biter or some gamma male that wants to argue and will go find some obscure article about something that, did, well, see, you're wrong because this one guy was right about this one thing. Uh, we don't play that game here. The totality of the, of the information and facts is that, we've been, that a narrative has been put forth by the global uh, masters of the universe, that we have to give them all this power and all of our money so that we can solve this, this, this uh, imminent, imminent uh, danger that's going to lead to an extinction of uh, the world and all the populations of the world. And it hasn't happened. They've never been right. You know, when I was a kid growing up, stay up late watching TV on Friday and Saturday nights, you know, we didn't have really have cable, but they had those UHF stations. They're like channel 43 or something like that. And they used to have these guys on there. I can't remember all their names now, but they were typically these evangel doomsday like evangelists you know hal Lindsay. i remember him wrote the book the great late great planet earth <clears throat> there were other ones they were always predicting you know israel would fire a rocket into palestine or vice versa and then that meant that the second coming of christ was going to happen next week and they were never right about anything 
And yet they continue to be on TV week after week, making wrong prophecies, wrong predictions, and people continue to send them money. I mean, there's a certain uh, cohort of people, I guess, that will believe anything. Uh, P.T. Barnum said that there's a sucker born every minute, you know, and uh, that's what he did, right? Uh, he had all of his shows and his weird claims or these wild claims and you would pay a nickel to go see the tarantula woman or the gorilla lady or whatever. <clears throat> and, um, you know, it was always a big letdown because it was just a big con and a big, big fraud. And that's kind of what we've, this has degenerated into. It's, you know, as I've said before, and uh, people, this is my view. This is just one man's view, but I think it's becoming shared by more people now. We have this great divide between the masters of the universe, our so-called leadership, uh, these one percenters, the globalists, these people that are in power, where they want to hold on to power. And so people have gotten wise, are getting more and more wise to the grift. And so they keep concocting these uh, crises. I mean, H.L. Mencken, who was a famous... Um, observer of things back in the early 20th century he was a columnist and he was kind of a cynical guy you should look up some of his quotes but he says that's what people in government do right they invent these hobgoblins and tell these you know spin these tales of these hobgoblins that are hiding in the forest that are going to get us and you know we have to give them power so they can go and slay the uh you know the demons and the hobgoblins for us and these things don't exist they're imaginary but that's what the grift is, right? The earth's going to end. So give us your power, give us power and give us all your money. Um, you're seeing, it's starting to get stupid now. Well, this week, we saw Gavin Newsom say that California is going to not be drilling for oil after 2024 or something like that. I mean, I think it's the fourth or fifth largest petroleum producing state in the U.S. Uh, I've seen, I saw a newspaper article, I didn't put it on here, but I saw a newspaper article where Oregon's saying that they're going to ban the raising of livestock because of climate change. I mean, how stupid is this going to get? And, you know, a large portion of the people actually believe this stuff. Propaganda, agate prop, uh, the shaping of opinions by media, it does work. It worked, it's worked many times throughout history and it's working now. But I think with the, like I said before in a previous video, they are trying their best to get rid of alternative media, get rid of people that have alternative views. But I think the genie's out of the bag. And I think, you know, every time that they cancel somebody, they just go off to another site, bit shoot or something like that. Your, your audience doesn't always go. I mean, Stefan Molyneux is now on Vox Vox Days, uh, new unauthorized TV site. So you, you can't, it's like whack-a-mole. I mean, the, the genie's out of the bag. It's like the printing press in Gutenberg, you know? The elites had all this illiteracy and the church dogma that they could control people back in the Middle Ages. And then the printing press came out and it, you know, made the written word ubiquitous ideas. People became literate and they started thinking for themselves. And the same thing's happening here. I mean, eventually the promises and things that these people say don't come true. And when I think, as I've said before, what is going to be the catalyst for change? I think there's a real, it's kind of like plate tectonics or something. It's like the caldera in Yellowstone National Park. You don't know when it's going to blow, but it's going to. Tremendous pressure is building under, the, under Yellowstone. And at some point, a super volcano is going to emerge and cause a lot of uh, destruction. And I think the same thing is going to happen with the body politic and, elect and the uh, elect electorate. I mean, people's goals, aspirations, dreams are not being realized. And at some point, the leaders are going to have to answer for it. And no amount of propaganda, nonsense, or BS is going to be able to cover up for the failings of the compact that the government and the leaders have not delivered. And uh, I don't know how long that's going to take, but that's what I think is going to happen. And they're not going to be able to, um, they're not going to be able to restrict the dissemination of, of information and, and ideas. So Anyways, uh, I'll put a link to that uh, website because it's very interesting. You can, it's not just two or three things. It's, you could spend like an hour reading all the information of all the failed predictions that all of these charlatans have been putting out for the last 50 years. 
So, you know, I have it on this slide, you know, Earth Day, never having to say you're sorry. It goes back to what I was saying. These people are never right. You know, modern doomsdayers have been predicting climate and environmental disasters since the 1960s. They continue to do so today. None of the apocalyptic predictions with due dates as of today have come true. I took this quote from uh, uh, Wall Street. This is a Gordon Gecko quote. He was talking about some idiots that he was dealing with. He said, if these guys were running a funeral parlor, no one would die. I mean, that's how bad the predictions are. You know, back in, if you study early religions, it's kind of ubiquitous across a lot of them. But if you even look at like in the Old Testament, if you put yourself out as a prophet back in the day, back in, you know, early history times, and you said, I'm a prophet, I have a direct line, and I'm going to make these predictions, and your predictions didn't come true, your prophecies didn't come true, that was a problem for you. You would get killed. You'd be stoned. They didn't, they didn't deal with it. Am I at, now, again, we're going to have some gamma out there. Well, John's advocating for the stoning or the liquidation of people that put out false prophecies. No, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that there's not a cost nowadays to being able to do that. Paul Ulrich and this James Hansen are still running around loose, giving congressional testimony, being put up there as, you know, people we should listen to that have some kind of, you know, knowledge and insight when they've never been right about anything ever. So, and, and what does it come down to? You know, well, this prediction was wrong, but just give us more money and more power. That's the problem. We didn't have enough money and power when we tried it the first time. Give us more money and power and we'll make it right this time. See, this is what it is. It's a grift. It's a con. It's a fraud. And, you know, I think a lot of people are catching on to it. But then you're going to have, you know, the ankle biter come back and say, but science, John, what about science? You're not a scientist. You're not, you, you don't have a PhD. I, I went through that before with some, one of the companies I worked for. I pointed out some facts about the assumptions made on a power plant we built that were incorrect. I was managing the plant. So we had these pro forma data sets that I was supposed to be able to meet that some PhD back in the office put together in the model so that they could get the financing for the plant. And it looked good on paper. The bank gave us the financing. And then me as the operations, or as the plant manager, we, we weren't hitting the targets because the targets were not realistic. And when I pointed that out, well, you need to figure out how to make it work. You see, it's not, you know, and, and when I questioned it, I was called to the carpet. Well, the person that put this together has a PhD. You just have an associate's degree. What do you know? Well, reality is what it is. We're not getting the production because of X, Y, and Z, regardless of who put the model together. They were The model's wrong for whatever reason. That's not casting aspersions of that particular person. It's just saying, well, you probably need to take a look at the model. You know, but that's not how people's that's not how people's minds work. And these weren't dumb people, but it's part of the political. You know, when you buy into a narrative, you're not. You know, what did somebody say once? I uh, forget who it was. It's hard to get a man to change his views when his living depends on him not changing his views. You see, that's what it comes down to in many cases. Science. You know, but here's my opinion. Now, this is going off onto a tangent. A lot of people don't like this, but I'm going to say what I want because this is my channel. Science is the new religion for a people that have abandoned traditional religion. Okay, that's passe. That's superstition. We don't need that. We're modern. I went to, you know, I have a four-year degree from, you know, an Ivy League university. I don't need, you know, 10,000 years, 5,000 years of, you know, tradition because science, John... But the science is, they're not right a lot of times. They're, over and over and over, they've been proven to be wrong. But for people that believe nothing, they will believe anything. You see what I'm saying? People that believe nothing will believe anything. Because, like I've said before, human beings have that innate desire or something that's built into them that they need to believe in something bigger than themselves. And so, for some people, that's, you know, the traditional... Uh, religions. For some people, this is a political thing that they're involved with. For some people, it's Mother Earth and the environment, worshiping the Earth. You're going to worship something, I guarantee it, if you're a human being. But uh, I'll put a link to that. I think it's interesting. The facts are the facts. These people are never right. So why do we keep giving them power and we keep listening to them? That's, uh, you know, be interesting to hear people's views of that in the comments. This is a Forbes article. I'll put a link to it. You know, I can, 
I get emails from people. We've had a recent pullback in uranium stocks. Uh, is this the end of the bull market? Uh, no. I mean, this is why. This is part of the reason. This is like the singular factor of why I'm bullish on, on um, uranium long term. China will lead the world in nuclear power. China now leads the world in total energy production and also produces almost twice the amount of electricity that the United States does. With over a third of China's population still being poor or in abject poverty, this will grow even more. Yes, this is a fact. If you got 1.2 billion people in China and a third are energy poor, that means that's three... 100 to 400 million people. 300 to 400 million people is like the individual population of the United States or the EU. So this is why China is building all types of energy sources, nuclear, coal, renewables, everything, because they're racing to, to get these people out of poverty and to get them energy, consistent energy, reliable energy, cheap energy. That raises standards of living. That leads to a higher quality of life. As of this month, China has 49 nuclear reactors in operation with a capacity of 47.5 gigawatts, third only to the United States and France, and 17 under construction with a capacity of 18.5 gigawatts. None have been shut down. Nuclear provides only 2% of China's electrical power now, but the country intends nuclear to eventually surpass all other sources. Hmm. This is very interesting. This is now, this is a bifurcation or a dichotomy that we're starting to see. China is racing to build nuclear power plants, base load power, clean, reliable, cheap nuclear power. The United States is shutting down its base load. It's shutting down coal. Okay. It's putting restrictions on other fossil fuel type generation, i.e. natural gas. We are not building nuclear power plants. We have two under construction, but no other in the pipeline that I can think of. And we're putting this emphasis on renewables. Most, a lot of the renewables are built in China. Did you know that? So, you know, who's got this one right and who's got it wrong? And so this is why I'm bullish on uranium. There's no discussion about new uranium mines though. And this is just China. What about India? What about the Philippines? What about Indonesia? What about Vietnam? What about Myanmar? What about Bangladesh? What about North Africa? What about the sub-Saharan African countries? You see where this is going? And the climate goals that have been put out there by the uh, big thinkers in the West say that actual energy use in the world is going to decline over time. Are they out of their minds? And so at some point, this is going to lead to conflict because you've already seen this week, there was another article I read where the Biden administration knows that, you know, China and India, these places, I, I've pointed this out over and over in previous videos, they pay lip service to the climate goals. They're not going to meet them. Their, their objective is to get their people out of poverty. And they're going to do that using fossil fuels. It's just that simple. And whether the West likes it or not is not going to matter. So now that's, is that going to lead to some type of problem in the future if we're going to put all of our chips on this deal? What are we going to do? Threaten them? You know, you've seen a lot of offshoring from your, Europe and the United States of energy intensive, energy, dirty type, considered dirty industries to these other places because of the regulations and the high energy costs in places like Germany and what's going to eventually happen in the U.S., and so the idea from the Biden administration is, what's here we're talking about, maybe we'll have to put tax levies on imported goods from places that don't share our views on the climate. Is that going to lead to some problems down the line, politically, economically? Is that deflationary? No, it's going to be inflationary. So you see where this is going. I got this uh, slide record China coal usage is what it's supposed to say. This is from Bloomberg. Record Chinese coal burning to drive surge in carbon emissions. Energy sector emissions will nearly recover from 2020 dip. A rebounding coal power in Asia will push up carbon emissions. Chinese coal consumption is poised to hit a record this year. 
contradicting a view held by many climate change and energy experts that the voracious coal usage in the world's second biggest economy had peaked. A 4% surge in Chinese coal demand coupled with higher consumption elsewhere in Asia, something we've been talking about, as well as in the US and Europe, will trigger a large increase in carbon emissions, the International Energy Agency said. Days before global leaders plan a virtual gathering to discuss the climate change challenge. It's not going to happen, guys. Uh, if the U.S. and Europe want to prefer, want to continue down the path of economic ritual seppuku by raising the cost of energy and restricting the access to energy in their countries, no one's going to stop us from doing that. Uh, these other countries are not going to go along with it. If you haven't figured that out now, then you're just obtuse. That's why I'm bullish on energy. In order to have economic growth, in order to get people out of poverty, requires tremendous amounts of energy. It's not going to come from windmills and solar panels. Uh, it's just That's just a fact. It, the math doesn't work. The engineering doesn't work. The sun doesn't shine at night and the wind doesn't blow all the time. Those are facts and they are not in dispute. But yet people will come on here and dispute this. So you have a long term over the next 10 years. This is why I think it's going to be a tremendous decade for energy investors because many of these countries are now hitting their s curves on energy usage which is going to start accelerating not decelerating not leveling out you know the us is a small and europe are a small portion of the world population like 15 percent. no one and they're in decline who cares what the us and europe think china india these places are on the ascent and I've pointed out time and time again what their leaders have told people in the West. The Chinese just lie and play, pay lip service. They don't care. The Indians tell you straight up, we have the right to develop and we're going to develop. We have the right to have skyscrapers and, you know, power also. And that's not going to come from just solar panels and wind farms. It's going to be coal. It's going to be nuclear. It's going to be natural gas. So I get emails and occasional texts or DMs on Twitter, hey, these oil stocks have really moved. Do you think the move's over with? Well, I mean, this is a, here's the chart, basically, of U.S. oil, gas, and coal equities relative to the S&P 500. Well, we've had a little bit of a blip. I, I would say that probably um, based on the previous times that we've had peaks in this, no, I don't think it's over with yet. Maybe it is. Maybe I'm all wet. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe fossil fuels are in going in terminal decline. I don't think I am though. They're going to be in decline in the West and US because we've we've hitched our wagon to, you know, la la land fantasy uh, type thinking. The rest of the world's not going to, and, and as far as the populations of, of Europe and the US, they're inconsequential to what the rest of the world's going to do or is doing. So no, I think that we have a 10 year run here and you're going to, when this is over with, this is going to be up here somewhere. This is nothing. This is just a fart in the wind. We haven't even, this is, a, this is nothing. And we've already had some of the stocks move, you know, 100, 200%. We've seen nothing yet. I hear the train is coming. What is the train that's coming is CPI. So here is a, here's some, I got this off Twitter your CPI year over year index going back to like 2006. Um, what you have is in white, you have the CPI year over year. You can see it's moving up um, almost in a straight line now because of the uh, what's going on with the supply disruptions and all the money printing around the world in the US in particular. But what you also have here is the empire prices paid, uh, which is a leading indicator, comes out, you know. And this is, you know, these are prices paid by manufacturers and businesses for products and services. And what you see is a pretty decent correlation between the empire prices paid index and CPI. So, I mean, right now where the empire prices paid is at, we could easily see a quick move in the CPI up to, you know, people are saying, well, 3% is probably the most for this year. I mean, there's no reason this thing can't get, you know, up to 5% like right now. 
Um, I know they fiddled around quite a bit with CPI calculations, but I mean, it's becoming apparent now what's happening. Uh, stuff's starting to move through the economy. Price rises are being pushed through, and I'll get to that in another slide. But you see it's coming. Okay? I mean, we've seen this in the past. So you've been warned. I mean, do I think it's transitory? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if the policies continue to be, you know, inflationary. Uh, maybe it is. Maybe Powell and Yellen and the rest of the masters of the universe got it right. But uh, right now, we're going to have an inflationary shock, and then we're going to have to see what the policymakers do. If they continue to let it run, then we'll have to, you know, or if they, you know, start raising rates or doing whatever they're going to do to try to get it under control. We'll see. This is what I was just talking about. Companies begin passing on higher costs. I'll put the uh, link to this article. It's a Wall Street Journal article. Procter & Gamble this fall will start charging more for household staples from diapers to tampons, the latest and biggest consumer products company to announce price increases. The maker of Gillette razors and Tide detergent cited rising costs for raw materials, such as resin and pulp and higher expenses to transport goods. Quote, this is one of the bigger increases in commodity costs that we've seen over the period of time that I've been involved with this, which is a fairly long period of time, said Procter & Gamble Operating Chief John Moeller, a 33-year company veteran. So this guy's been around for 33 years and is saying this is one of the biggest increases in commodity costs that he's ever seen. And so they're passing this on to consumers. Do you think that if this is transitory, that once prices come back down, if they do, that they're going to lower costs? I don't know, maybe, but probably not. So, I mean, I could sit here all day and just go over the prices of commodities and how much they've increased over the last year or two years. Some of them in the hundreds of percent. You know, lumber, we talk about that. But the ag complex, the grains are going nuts. Copper's up almost 100%. Talking about agriculture. Something's happening in world agriculture. Something's happening in China. This goes back to 1961. These are Chinese, Chinese corn imports. Look what happened in the, so far this year. I mean, this is unprecedented. Why? Were you paying attention last year when they had all the floods in China? It wiped out a lot of their agricultural areas that grew corn. So they're having to import tremendous amounts of corn. But this is something that's been happening for the last decade. Why? Because as people get wealthier, they want more protein in their diet. That means livestock, pigs, chickens, ducks, cows, all the stuff that we take for granted. The Chinese want it too. And then you start getting to these, you know, extrapolating across these numbers. They don't still want to eat, you know, rice and, you know, bean curd. And so corn is typically used as an animal feed, right? So this is what we're seeing. And then you throw on a bad crop here. This is what I keep talking about. We've been blessed with years and years of good crop outcomes. Yes, we've had you know, one-offs here and there, but I, as I've been forecasting, I believe we're gonna be moving into a more regular time of poor crop conditions, poor weather conditions for crops that are gonna be more ubiquitous around the world. Okay, you're going to have more, more uh, of these type of events, and it's not going to be because of global warming. You're going to have shorter growing seasons. You're going to have rain. You're going to have more frosts. You're going to have later frosts, earlier frosts. Condensed growing seasons leads to lower yields, crop failures, things of this nature. And so if you think inflation is bad, wait till food costs start going through the roof. Why? Because not so much in the developed world, but in developing countries, the cost of food can represent up to 50% of a person's or a family's earnings or more. And so if they food costs go up 30, 40, 100%, that's detrimental to their ability to survive. That causes political turmoil. If you remember the, the, um, what do they call it? The, when it happened in Tunisia and Egypt, the Arab Spring, a lot of that was not caused because people wanted to be free. It was caused because food prices were up tremendous, tremendously and people were protesting about increased food costs and less subsidies from the government. 
I mean, you've got a place like Egypt that has what almost over a hundred million people living there, and they're dependent on this little strip of agriculture that goes on along the Nile River. And the population's not done growing there. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. Um, I've talked a lot about energy. Uh, I'm getting more and more bullish on coal. As a matter of fact, I'm adding a coal stock to the actionable intelligence alert newsletter this week or this month. I already have one met coal stock in there that's done fairly well. And now uh, we're going to be moving more into coal. I believe that coal prices are moving higher. I believe we're seeing a turn now in a lot of the coal stocks. And I just think from a perspective of long term that this is a tremendous opportunity. So if you are interested in that, you can check out a subscription to the actionable intelligence alert newsletter. Uh, it's $150 a year. You get 12 issues. You get access to all the back issues. The typical issues, probably anywhere from 12 to 15 pages, can be upwards of 2,500 to 3,500 words. Um, and we talk about not only new recommendations, but what's going on in the markets, doing updates on companies we hold in the portfolio. And uh, I think it's, it's the portfolio has done tremendously well during this reflationary period that we're in. So we're really set up for that. Uh, we'll see if that continues, but uh, so far, so good. So if you're interested in that, please consider taking a subscription. You can also, I put out a weekly email to my email list. It's more general, but I do talk about these type of themes and more in depth. I don't necessarily give you stock picks in there, but I give you, I will talk about emerging themes and things that I'm looking at. A lot of people find it useful. Um, there's a link down in the show notes if you're interested. If you sign up for my email list, I'll actually give you a free ebook that I published recently about uh, 10 rules for investing that uh, I find have uh, been useful to me. So take a look at that if you're interested. So that's it for this week, guys. Appreciate the um, support and we'll talk to you next week. Thanks.